Systemic lupus erythematosus, or SLE for short, is an autoimmune disease mediated by autoantibodies and immune complexes which target nearly every organ in the body. SLE is a chronic multi-system disorder that most commonly affects women during their reproductive years. The pathophysiology of SLE involves injury to the body's own cells, leading to damaged cell proteins and their DNA. Injury to a group of cells can subsequently lead to organ injury. The pathophysiology of SLE is thought to involve an interplay between genetics, for example, SLE is seen in monozygotic twins, and there's also influences of epigenetics, immunology factors, hormonal factors such as estrogen, and mainly environmental factors. Environmental factors is thought to be the initial trigger for SLE. These environmental factors include UV light, infections such as Epstein-Barr virus, smoking, and even potentially certain drugs that increases oxidative stress damage that will lead to the cells being damaged. Important to note that these environmental risk factors are agents which humans are commonly exposed to, suggesting that people who develop SLE has to have some sort of genetic susceptibility. When cells are damaged, they can try to repair themselves. If they can't, they undergo programmed cell death called apoptosis. When cells undergo apoptosis, internal proteins are displayed on their surface blebs. A normal response is when our immune system clears up these apoptotic cells. This is done by phagocytes such as macrophages and monocytes. However, if apoptotic cells are not cleared efficiently, nuclear material is exposed to the immune system, which may then become sensitized and eventually the immune system will mount an attack on our own proteins and nuclear material. Some people who develop SLE are seen to have deficiency in some complement proteins such as C1, C2, and C3 and C4. These proteins are important to help macrophages clear up certain cells such as these apoptotic cells we mentioned earlier through opsonization for example. Deficiency in these early complement proteins mean apoptotic cells are not cleared efficiently. When proteins and nuclear material are not cleared properly, they are exposed to the immune system. The immune system is thought to become sensitized to these materials. So next time they encounter such material, their body will mount an immune response towards their own proteins and nuclear material. The process of sensitization begins when an immature antigen-presenting cell, such as an immature macrophage or dendritic cell, notices and picks up proteins and nuclear material from the apoptotic cells through special receptors such as toll-like receptor. The antigen picked up by the antigen-presenting cells include nuclear proteins, cytoplasmic proteins, and membrane components of the cell. Nuclear antigens include histone core, double-stranded DNA, and ribonucleoprotein complexes, including SM, NRNP, and Rho. Cytoplasmic components also include Rho, a small variant, and cell membrane antigens, including cardiolipin, found in mitochondria, and maybe platelet membranes or red blood cell membrane components as well. Regardless, the antigens that are picked up by the antigen-presenting cell are then displayed on the surface of the antigen-presenting cell. The antigens are presented to naive T-helper cells in nearby lymph nodes. The naive T-helper, when activated, can become a number of different types of T-helper cells. In the case of systemic lupus erythematosus, where antibodies play the main role, interleukin-4 secreted favors T helper 2 cell maturation. T helper 2 cells promotes the humoral immune response and so the antibody mediated immune response. T helper 2 cells stimulate B cell activation and B cell proliferation. Activated B cells become plasma cells, the cells responsible for producing the antibodies. 
in this case, autoantibodies, which are the antibodies towards a person's own antigens. Remember, the antibodies produced target the antigens which the antigen-presenting cell picked up, such as the double-stranded DNA, the histone, the SM, the Rho, the cardiolipin. Therefore, the antibodies produced are autoantibodies because they target self-antigens. Most of these autoantibodies target the nuclear proteins of the cells, which are collectively known as ANA. Now, these autoantibodies can also form immune complexes when exposed to their target antigens. The antigen targeted are found in all cells, and so these autoantibodies can easily target any cell in the body. When the autoantibodies come in contact with nuclear proteins, for example, a few mechanisms of inflammation can occur. Firstly, through immune complex formation and then deposition to organs resulting in complement activation augmenting the inflammatory response. The immune complexes can bind onto FC receptors of immune cells, which will trigger the release of pro-inflammatory cytokines promoting inflammation. The autoantibodies may bind on antigens on the cell surface or directly into the internal proteins, resulting in complement activation and release of cytokines from the cell. Finally, the immune cells around the area are eventually sensitized to the antigens, and so when the Tolric receptor detects nuclear antigens, for example, they will release cytokines, promoting the inflammation, the inflammatory response. These different mechanisms cause inflammation to the surrounding area, causing further organ injury and damage. This will further cause a cascade of damaged cells and the cycle continues. Once the inflammation settles through the intrinsic regulation of the immune system, the body will slowly recover. However, SLE is an ongoing chronic illness. A feature of SLE are its flare-ups. Flare-ups or flares in SLE appears to reflect immunologic memory. Flare-up occurs in response to another exposure of the antigen. So really, any precipitating factor that causes cell or mast cell apoptosis can trigger flare-ups. And apoptosis exposes the nuclear materials to the immune cells. Precipitating factors include sun exposure, infections, stress, surgery, and pregnancy. Patients with SLE generally have higher numbers of B cells, plasma cells, plasma blasts, which are the immature plasma cells, and higher proportions of activated T cells than normal individuals. Cytokines which stimulate B cell activation include interleukin-6 and interleukin-10. At least 50% of patients with SLE have increased levels of B lymphocyte stimulator, a growth factor for B cell survival, maturation, antibody production, and differentiation into plasma cells. Risk factors for SLE is up to 20 times more common in women than men, and most likely to develop between the ages of 15 to 40 years. Female sex is a risk factor due to the role of hormones, which increases the susceptibility to develop SLE. One characteristic of the immune response is the ability of our body to create immunological or immunologic memory. That is memory immune cells that are ready to mount a response when they encounter the same antigen again. Flares in SLE, as mentioned, appear to reflect immunologic memory, occurring in response to exposure of the antigens again. The long-lived plasma cells, as the name suggests, are plasma cells which live longer and typically reside in the bone marrow. Long-lived plasma cells can remember the same antigen when exposed to it again and begin secreting more autoantibodies to help. Finally, to complete the diagram, we talked about T helper 2 cells, which help mount the humoral immune response. Then there's a T helper 1 cells, is the other arm of the T helper activation. However, T helper 1 cells promote the cell-mediated immune response, and so do not play a big role in the pathophysiology of SLE. 
there are many signs and symptoms of SLE. Most complain of constitutional symptoms such as fatigue, myalgia, weight loss, and fever. The most common symptom or sign is a UV sensitive butterfly rash over the nasal bridge and malar bones, which occur in 50% of people. Individuals can also be sensitive to light. The other cutaneous features uh, include discoid rash. Neurological involvement is, very, is common and include cognitive impairment, which is very common. Headaches, seizures, uh, which is, and seizures are these uncontrolled electrical firing in the brain. Delirium and psychosis, as well as peripheral neuropathies. Pulmonary involvement include interstitial fibrosis and pulmonary vasculitis. Pulmonary pleuritis and pleural effusions are seen in one third of patients and are usually small. Cardiovascular involvement include pericardial disease, which tend to be asymptomatic unless pericardial effusion becomes so big it will cause symptoms of chest pain and difficulty breathing. Asymptomatic myocarditis is also common, and there is also a risk of valvular heart disease. Hypertension is a common complication of SLE and has to be well managed. Hypertension is probably due to uh, complications of renal involvement seen in SLE. Renal involvement is seen in at least one third of uh, SLE patients, and this is called lupus nephritis, where the antibodies and the antibody complexes deposits at the glomerulus, the functional units of the kidneys, um, and long term this can lead to renal failure. Gastrointestinal involvement include these non-specific abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting that can be hepatomegaly, and ulcerations as well, which tend to be from medications. Hematological involvement occurs in about half the patients and include chronic anemia and leukopenia. Also can have complications uh, from the immunosuppressive drugs used to treat SLE, which can also cause the same things. Musculoskeletal findings include arthralgia and arthritis, which is common. Morning stiffness and polyarticular symmetrical arthralgias or arthritis occur in 90% of the cases. Patients with SLE can experience Raynaud's phenomenon, which is an episodic pallor or cyanosis of the fingers due to vasoconstriction of the arterioles in the fingers in response to cold or emotional stress. Finally, osteopenia and osteoporosis is an important part of SLE and is a multifactorial cause in SLE, which we will learn about later. Investigations for workup for SLE include a full blood count, electrolyte urea creatinine to look for kidney function, LFTs, liver involvement, and CRP, ESR for inflammation. A urine tests which involve urinalysis, urine microscopy, and urinary albumin creatinine ratio is very important to monitor kidney function. SLE serum markers must be ordered. These serological markers are essentially antibodies detected against uh, self-antigens. The antigens we discussed, which include nuclear proteins, cytoplasmic and cell membrane components. These serological markers include antibodies against double-stranded DNA. You, you can find antihistamine, anti-SM, anti-Rho, anti-NRNP. Uh, All these antibodies target different nuclear proteins. Anti-nuclear antibody, or ANA, is another test to order, which really encompasses all these antibodies. ANA should be ordered in someone suspected of having SLE or any connective tissue disease. Then there's other tests such as ENA, anticardiolipin, and anti-rheumatoid factor. Serum markers associated with disease flare-ups include reduced complement 3 and complement 4, and increase in um, anti-double-stranded DNA. Remember to think about drug-induced systemic lupus erythematosus for someone with no history of SLE, someone who also recently began a new drug and has a positive uh, ANA. Management of SLE involves just general principles such as avoiding UV light exposure, vitamin D and calcium supplements, reduce the cardiovascular risk through weight loss, stop smoking, stop alcohol, and also managing the cholesterol. 
Now, to understand how the pharmacological drugs help in SLE, let's quickly revise the immune response again. So remember, antigen-presenting cells presents a self-antigen to the T helper cell. Interleukin-2 is a cytokine which stimulates T helper activation and proliferation. The interleukin-4 is one that helps uh, produce T helper-2 cells, which then activates and promotes B cell activation. Activated B cells become plasma cells, which produce autoantibodies, a hallmark of SLE. Examples of pharmaceutical used in SLE include tacrolimus, which is a calcineurin inhibitor, inhibiting interleukin-2 production and function. This will suppress T cell activity. Mycophenolate and azathioprine are drugs which reduce lymphocyte activity, both the B and T cells, suppressing the immune system. Belumimab is a monoclonal antibody that blocks the B lymphocyte stimulator. Remember, this molecule, which is overexpressed in people with lupus, promotes the survival and differentiation of B cells. Inhibiting it, therefore, aims to reduce antibody-producing B cells. During the inflammatory process in SLE, specifically during the flare-ups, immune cells and damaged cells release pro-inflammatory cytokines. Glucocorticoids are a mainstay for SLE and help suppress this inflammatory response. NSAIDs are also useful, especially for musculoskeletal pain associated with SLE. Controlled blood pressure, as mentioned, is important in SLE. Antihypertensives are therefore important. The complications of SLE include osteoporosis, and this is due to many factors. Low vitamin D from low sun exposure in patients with SLE. Renal osteodystrophy from renal impairment. Steroid use, which increases risk of osteoporosis. Age and being female, as low fluctuating estrogen levels increases the risks of osteoporosis. Other complications include antiphospholipid syndrome, occurring in one-third of patients with SLE. Remember also that SLE increases the risk of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma.